All right, so I actually wasn't planning on talking about the Idaho 4 topic that I brought to the table this week. And uh, for those of you that are new here or uh, recently started following us, um, you know, obviously we are a talk show where this is completely unscripted and at most we just bring bullet points and we like to critically think and go deep into some of these topics, you know. And uh, with the Koberger topics, we aren't trying to say that he's innocent. We are not trying to say that he's guilty. We are trying to analyze the case as it stands with the information we have. And yep. our commitment to the viewer, to you guys, is that we are going to share everything we know with you. So there's no such thing as topics that you can't talk about. That just does not exist. Anyone that says it is, they're full of it. You know, it, it just doesn't exist. It's all how you present yourself. It's all the level of respect you give to the person in front of you. You can have respectful debates. I mean, our presidents go at each other's throat in a debate, you know, but it's semi-respectable in front of the entire country most of the time. <laughs> Mm. Now, kind of, <laughs> there's been a couple topics brought up. The reason why I want to bring this up is because I, I just found a new piece of information when I was digging into this. Now, I didn't do an expert topic this week, even though so many people wanted us to. They're like in love with the the nerdy expert topics. But that's awesome. I think that this could get that way too. So there have been multiple conversations or responses brought up around the Brian Koberger knife sheath. Okay. Now I don't want to go tin hat here. You guys, I do not want to go to, uh, him being set up or anything like that. I really think that it benefits everybody when we look at this, uh, when we look at this evidence, from the perception of the court, either the state or the defense, and see what they're up against, okay? Now, what's interesting here is this actually involves Howard Blum, and I never knew that before, okay? What? Now, there's this idea, and I, I think there could be some validity to it, and I think that this could be the reason why the state doesn't want to show chain of custody with the DNA. Now, from our understanding and based on the PCA, um, the uh, Idaho State Police Forensics Lab found the DNA profile, built the DNA profile, or attempted to, and, or I'm sorry, let me take that back. They got it. They got the DNA off the sheath. Uh, they put it in CODIS, and CODIS wasn't there, so they sent it off, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the official storyline? Yep. Or they gathered it and gave it to the FBI, who then built the profile. Something like that, okay? Now, the other side of that, and this is what I've heard from many people, is that there is a third-party source involved in Texas, Mm -hmm. Now, according to everything I'm reading, Howard Blum is the one who came out with that information. Oh. Never heard of that before. I had no idea. So here's that other storyline, is that the knife sheath was found, sent to Idaho State um, evidence, and they tested it for DNA, found no DNA, so it was sent, the entire sheath, okay, not, not a DNA profile, the entire sheath was sent to Texas. It, it, it's a startup company, and I have the name in here. I, I'll pull it up in just a second. But uh, they use this new technique that supposedly takes singular cells or only a couple cells and profiles and they build a profile. It somehow multiplies it. This is not my expertise, guys, but it multiplies it into a size where they have enough to test because based on all the uh, evidence or all the investigation, all the details I've been looking into around DNA testing, they need at least 25 cells. I thought they only needed eight. They, they need eight to be able to build... 
25. And you guys, if you're an expert in this, help me out here. You know, leave some comments. Let me know. Give me some love. Let me understand it. But from my understanding, the basic testing with some of the most advanced technology is roughly five per test. They do the scientific method, which is three tests to come up with a profile that at best gets to about 98% completion. And then they have a control test and uh, a quality control test that is two more tests just to verify the first three, Hmm. which requires a total of 25. So when, um, when multiple people have read that they only had a single source DNA profile. You have experts that are all over the internet or claiming they're experts. Obviously I can't verify that that are saying there's no way that's not possible. Hmm. So I went to digging a little bit, see what I could find out about Texas right now. This Texas uh, location apparently is Othram. Now that's confirmed in the PCA that Othram was used. What they used was what's called kin snip rapid familial relationship testing. Okay, it's developed by Othram. Kin snip allows investigators to infer kinship in closely and distantly related individuals, combining the speed of traditional forensic STR testing with the power of advanced SNP testing. What does that mean? I mean, what I'm gathering from it is that if they don't have access to your DNA, but they have access to some relatives that are kind of far out. This helps build a profile to make connections to the familial relationship with those other DNA profile to give a percentage of accuracy for them to at least be have enough to present to the judge an arrest warrant, which I think is what we saw happen. Okay. But some really good questions get brought up in this. One... Was the knife sheath actually sent to Texas? I think that's a pretty big deal to find out because that is so rare. Like, can you imagine the leg up that the defense is going to have if they're able to say, hey, we want the chain of custody. And the chain of custody shows that ISP couldn't find DNA. So they sent the entire evidence, the knife sheath in whole, to Texas, who found the DNA. That's a bad look. Is it? Why? Hey, we can't do our job, so we sent it somewhere else, which every time a piece of evidence is moved, you're putting it at risk of the validity of that outcome. Yep, I would agree. So strange, right? Yeah, it is weird. And I I think when there is a test, either that they have to do unique, they have to go out of state, they have to do a second or third time, or it's inconclusive. Those are little items, little little catchphrases that defense attorneys use to see if there's reasonable doubt there. Now, again, it's got to be taken in comparison to all the other evidence, but certainly a defense team has to be pretty happy that that test did not come back positive to Koberger's DNA on it, for example. So yeah, it's something they're going to look at. I really want to know if that's the case, if it was sent to Othram. And I think the important part is also percentage of likeliness and how much that percentage equates to matters a lot. And, you know, in our last DNA video where you talked like Some of the numbers they threw out there don't make sense. No, they don't make sense. And what's interesting is while I was doing research on this, I started reading um, the uh, I started reading the details of the experts that they brought forward uh, that Ann Taylor brought forward into court to talk about um, what were their names again? Uh, Gabriel Vargas. Yep, Vargas. um, And there was Lee Larkin. Yep. And the guy who is actually a defense a attorney yeah. is a big shot. And he has actually been very involved with this new gene- like DNA SNP profile genealogy. Yep. You know, all of that. He's very involved in it because there was like a case that it was brought into question and it's all very new. And he's worked very closely with like he's been, literally been in the lab yes. you know, overseeing stuff like this. So um, 
I forget his name. I'll look it up, but he is a big shot in it. And he basically just explained why it was important to have this information presented to the court for the defense yeah, to be able the, to the see chain it. Of custody. Yes. Yep. And you know, each of them on their own accord came forward and said that uh, DNA evidence is never a hundred percent. Did you know that? The audio was so bad that most people don't know that. I, I literally had to read the transcript. Who? All of them said yeah. that DNA is never 100%. Right. So if you guys are watching and you haven't watched this video here, you guys need to watch it because uh, 5.37 octillion is about as 100% as you can get. So it makes me wonder what they're talking about with that. Agreed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are major questions that need to be asked with the knife sheath. Um, you know, th there's a reason why the prosecution didn't want to bring it into court. And uh, it, 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 it leads me to ask questions around why, right? And we said in the beginning of this that... We aren't here to try and argue the fact whether Koberger's innocent or guilty. We just want to be led to the facts through the evidence. That is our only goal here. Now, it's interesting that uh, everything is saying that that was Blum that came out with that information. I'm curious where he got that from, those details from. Agreed. Yeah. Because this is a completely separate situation. And he says, uh, so Howard Blum, a journalist and author working on a book about murders, maintains that the knife sheath was sent out of Idaho to be tested by a startup in Texas. In quotes, they sent it first to the lab in Idaho, and the lab in Idaho couldn't find anything. So they thought this might be a dead end. And uh, so they sent it to Texas. And then it said, on Wednesday, Blum appeared on News Nation explaining why the sheath was sent to another state. He claims it's because officials needed to make an arrest as soon as possible. In parentheses, they wanted to tie the suspect to this knife sheet, desperately to this knife well, sheet. It proves how much pressure they were under, you guys. I agree. Um, I, I don't think enough importance is placed on that, the pressure of solving this crime when it comes... Like, the university is everything to that town. Yeah. So, the, the police were under immense pressure to solve this by the families, they by were. the university, by the nation. Um, and they had there was a spotlight on them. There was a microscope on them. So, the lawyer that testified was Steve Mercer, and he yes. had expertise specifically on the subject of complex mixtures of touch DNA. Okay. Okay. And you know what's funny is it, it seems like when things are talked about in court, the further away that that court hearing gets, the more some of these older ideas start coming in. Like, I see so many people on Reddit and YouTube saying, there's no confirmation it's touch DNA. No confirmation it's touch DNA. What? Did, yes, you guys, did you guys not watch any of the court hearings? It is explained very clearly that it is touch DNA. Yeah, okay? we have absolute 100% confirmation on that. 100% confirmation. It is touch DNA, okay, and you contrary guys contrary to what Newsweek wants you to believe, right? That you it's guys a drop of blood. Yeah, you guys need to watch this video because uh, then I see people on the internet saying things like, "Yeah, but touch DNA like that; those skin cells can only come from multiple layers under the skin, and it's literally the opposite of that. Every little tiny baby skin cell that comes off, and we shed millions of them a day just by doing this. I'm putting my DNA all over here." Um, was proven with those two tests that we walked through uh, that it is, can be spread from one handshaken person to another item and used in Absolutely. a murder. Absolutely. It's actually the exterior skin cells. Yes, it is. On the outermost is. layer of your skin. It is not from underneath <laughs> at all. Yes. That's not true at all. Yeah. Now, according to Blum, the lab in Texas specialized in proprietary devices that made what is called kinship DNA. You could figure out a relative of the DNA that you already had. And this lab was set up to investigate unsolved murders. This is literally the first time that this lab has ever had an item sent to it for an active... No freaking way. Yeah, an active case. Now, if... 
this is true. Understand, we we do shows for people that believe Koberger's guilty and shows for people that believe he's innocent. And I think any of our videos you can look at from the perspective of the prosecution or the defense, right? You, there's going to be questions mm -hmm. around this evidence when you're the defense looking at, hey, how did they come to that conclusion? That doesn't make sense. Or you look at the prosecution and think, we need to firm up these details here because when looking at other cases out there that did include DNA, uh, they didn't have these kind of holes that these do, that right. this case does. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, it says it, it's a problem for the prosecution if the reports are accurate and the first lab did not match the DNA to Koberger. Uh, and that is... Niyama Ramani, an attorney and former Fred federal prosecutor uh, to Newsweek. Even though familial DNA matches are new, the state is going to have to explain why the first lab drew different conclusions. It's uncommon for such a bloody crime scene to have only a single source of DNA connected to a defendant. The defense will argue that it, that it was transferred or planted. There may also be a lot of other people's DNA at the scene because it was a party house. The defense will argue that law enforcement didn't rule them out as suspects. And this, according to what I'm reading here, was written... Oh, what? Where uh, April 2nd of 2023. So they knew what they were talking about. Interesting. Because that is that is the approach that the defense has taken. That is the approach that Ann Taylor has taken exactly, yep. which I think is right. I think it's yeah. fair when you have someone that is up for potentially a death penalty, right? And the whole world has questions around this knife sheath. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the biggest deals, which is funny. Because originally, they wanted to hide it. I I know. I know. But there's only one way to connect the warrant and arrest to Koberger, and that is that DNA. So they weren't able to keep it out. It just wasn't possible. No, which they asked. That's what, ex literally what they said word for word is they didn't want to use it in court. Yeah. When they brought it up to the judge initially, they are like, you know, this is probable cause, but we don't want to bring it to court. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So they should have known. They should have known. They should have known. They should have. Um, and uh, Marco Mara said defense attorneys look wherever they can to find a potential of reasonable doubt. And when there is a test, either that they have to do unique, they have to go out of state, they have to do a second or third time, or it's inconclusive, those are little items, little catchphrases that defense attorneys use to see if there's reasonable doubt there. Hmm. I think that all these questions are really, really good questions around this. Looking yeah. at it from the perspective of the court, okay? Whether you're watching this and you believe Koberger's guilty, there are some questions that need to be answered. Like, where did the knife sheath come from? I, I, I can't think that you could think that Koberger is guilty or innocent and be okay with not letting a defendant understand how they're tied to a crime. Uh, agreed. Like, if you want a fair justice system, then it has to be fair for all, okay? And they should be privy to that knowledge. And, you know, there's contradicting statements um, of who found it. There is contradicting statements and, of who found it. And two yes, documents, there is. the PCA and... Um, actually, I think there's it's another affidavit, too, by... Um, an ISP officer, I think. Yep. I don't know, Jay Ray is probably killing me right now. She's watching this that I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Because she's explained it to me like twice already. Um, but she did show the contradictory statements, and they are there, which yeah. we can post. Yeah. I just think that's super interesting, and uh, I, I, I don't understand why people are so easy to write off some of these questions and details. I think that that's a fair question to ask. Hey, where did the knife sheath go? Because of this DNA video and the uh, how, how many times we've seen in the past where a piece of evidence has been cross-contaminated. 
Yeah, it, it's not unheard of. And I feel like a lot of people just are under that impression, like we talked about in the DNA video, that if it's your DNA, it's 100% yours, then there's no refuting that. But that simply isn't true. And we have other cases to cite that prove it isn't true. I, I know it. I know it. But I half I halfway am making this video on this topic because I want to know what you guys think. I want to hear what you've read about this and what you know about this. Can we name and, and get confirmation of this Texas small startup? That would go a long way in my opinion. It would. That would go a long way in my opinion. If I can get the name, I'll absolutely reach out to them. I would call them. Yeah. They probably wouldn't give me anything, but I'd call them. <laughs> Why not? It doesn't hurt to try. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. But, um, yeah, let me know what you guys think. Share the wealth of knowledge. Yes. 